Hello, my name is Connie Davis. I'm the Strategic Deputy Director for the Oklahoma City Air Logistics Complex and an Air Force Sustainment Center, Art of the Possible subject matter expert. A little about me and my experience. Uh, I have almost 37 years of civilian experience uh, in, with the federal government. 25 years of that was spent in the aircraft maintenance group executing aircraft depot maintenance. I had the good fortune to be on the ground floor of adopting philosophies and concepts that make up art of the possible. First and foremost, I am an art of the possible believer and I'm a believer because I have seen it work over and over. My most recent position before taking the role of the uh, subject matter expert was as the 565th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron Director uh, for uh, where we perform B-52 program depot maintenance. Today, I'm going to provide a quick overview of Art of the Possible, then walk you through a high-level Art of the Possible application with my experience as uh, the B-52 process machine. Headquartered at Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma, the Air Force Sustainment Center is one of six specialized centers assigned to the Air Force Material Command. The Air Force Sustainment Center stood up in 2012 with the mission to provide sustainment and logistics readiness to deliver combat power for America. As a very high level overview, the Air Force Sustainment Center provides depot maintenance, repair, overhaul, air base wing, and supply chain support at Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia, Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma, and Hill Air Force Base, Utah, with a multitude of outlying units and supply chain entities. So just what is Art of the Possible? Well, it's Air Force, the Air Force Sustainment Center's business model, and it's been our business model since our inception in 2012. And it's really a mindset for how we execute our mission processes. We really think about our processes in their future state. Where do we need to be in the future? And we measure ourselves that. It really takes Industry concepts such as theory of constraints, lean, Six Sigma, continuous process improvement, and applies them to our often complicated and complex processes so that now our processes become visible. So once they're visible, we can manage them, we can measure them, we can adjust them, and most importantly, we can communicate them to others. Some other key ingredients for Art of the Possible, though, is that we really rely on leadership engagement and enterprise involvement. Our leadership has to be engaged and know our processes in order to, to protect them. And also, they have to create relationships, especially with our enterprise stakeholders. And that enterprise involvement is essential because our AFSC processes cannot achieve success on their own. We have to have enterprise involvement to make that happen. Air Force Sustainment Center's Art of the Possible philosophy focuses on the process, understanding the process, standardizing the process to make it repeatable, and improving the process. So this video uh, is of two very different pit stops, and it really in illustrates this concept. So let's watch the video, then I'll point out some key AOP-like aspects. Comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch.
tires are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. NASCAR video, the average pit stop times were four minutes, so 67 seconds was incredible and good enough for Bill Holland to get second place that day. But the second video of the 2013 Formula One pit stop really illustrates the power of focusing on the process and the process doer. The second video makes use of choreographing and improved tooling. Each person in that process had a specific role and performed their role in a defined and scripted way. There was no pickup game in that pit stop. This pit stop was about 2.7 seconds, uh, but the world record is actually 1.82 seconds. And that was set by the Red Bull Racing Team at the Brazilian Grand Prix in 2019. So the really the uh, takeaway here is that in AOP, we never settle for status quo, and we're always looking at what we can do to improve our processes to make us better. We see that Art of the Possible Roadmap as having three key components for success. First, there's the leadership model, and that serves as a foundation as we believe leadership is the most important art of the possible component, and influence is the single most important characteristic of leadership. Next is what we call the AOP cycle, which represents our method, the science and math behind how we construct and manage our process machines. This brings in uh, concepts like theory of constraints, Little's Law, tack time, and rules of flow. And finally, our radiator chart represents the key elements that are essential to setting up and executing our process machines. It's a reminder of all the essential elements for success. So I'll briefly discuss these components to provide the AOP basics, then use my experience with the B52 program depot maintenance machine to illustrate their use. So first, there's the leadership model, and leadership is so important that we have a model. So to describe the model, uh, think about uh, the centerpiece being the common goals. Um, that's what, as an enterprise, we agree we need to accomplish together. And then that's surrounded by the levers of people, resources, and process. So people being the right number of people with the right training and the right skill sets and the right empowerment, and resources being all the resources needed to execute our uh, mission to include infrastructure, computers, equipment, tooling, parts, all those resources that are necessary. And the third lever to execute our common goals is process, being that our processes have to be efficient and effective uh, to execute that common goal. And then that uh, those levers are surrounded by uh, the our four true north metrics of speed, safety, quality, and cost effectiveness. So speed is about um, process speed. It's not about cutting corners. It's not about working harder. It's about getting the most efficient and effective processes that create positive touch time for our process doers. And that's how we get speed. Uh, safety is our commitment to our people and quality is our commitment to our customers. And cost effectiveness is important in the sustainment center because we understand that the cost of sustainment affects the amount of readiness that the Air Force can afford. And then those true north metrics are surrounded by the desired leadership culture that creates the environment for success. So we have six attributes for our leaders that include teamwork, accountability, respect, transparency, credibility, and engagement. Most of those elements and attributes are self-evident, but I want to talk for a moment about transparency because what that means is having the courage to let others see inside your process, even if your process isn't 
rosy. Maybe it's a little messy, but we still let others see inside of it because that's how they learn about our process and learn how they can help us improve our process. So these six attributes are foundational to creating relationships that make our leaders influential and sets that ex environment for success. In the Air Force Sustainment Center, we view our aggregate mission processes as a machine. Uh, we might say our, a request for personnel action machine or a budget machine, a flap repair and overhaul machine, a B-52 program depot maintenance machine. You get the idea. Uh, our, our machine has requirements. And so requirements come into the machine and then the gears or levers of people, processes and resources add value uh, to our, pro uh, our process. And then they output combat capability. And then that fulcrum in the middle indicates that when the whip inside our process machine is down, that means capability for the warfighter is up and vice versa. So we really have to find that balance between the amount of whip in our machine and the amount of capability um, for our warfighter. Like the dials on a machine you use to see inside, see how the machine is functioning, if it's functioning well, uh, we uh, see our machine as operating with that same type of visibility. We want our process owners to be able to tell how their, their machine is performing, uh, to understand how it reacts to different inputs um, so uh, that they can keep it functioning well. Now I want to walk you through the method for setting up and managing a process machine. So the first step for a process machine is to understand the flow and find where the whip is located in the process. And that's uh, shown by that upper left-hand corner. Uh, and then as you define those steps, you're looking for the critical path. You find the critical path of the flow by understanding predecessor and successor relationships of those steps. The critical path is the longest path of dependent task, and it determines the length of your project. So any time lost on that critical path is time lost on the overall project. And then we then divide uh, that process into natural buckets of work along the critical path called gates. These gates become the language we use to communicate about our machines to others. When you read the four examples on the right, you get the feel for what's going on inside the machine. So whether it's an aircraft machine or a commodities machine or DLA's emergency procurement process machine, or LG's non-technical special projects machine. If you have a project inside one of those machines and you get told it's in this certain gate and this gate takes this certain amount of time, you really have a feel uh, for the status of your project and how it's moving uh, through that machine. The gates become the basis we use for measuring our machine and for synchronizing the needs of the machine to enterprise stakeholders. The, most predict the more predictable your machine becomes, the more succinct the synchronization becomes. Once you have an understanding of the flow and you have gates and you know where your work is, where your whip is located, you're now ready for the map of setting your road to goal for your machine. So the first step of setting your road to goal is to understand the burning platform. So think about your process, what, what it needs to produce in the future. Uh, is there a certain amount of whip that you need to capture? Is there a certain amount of throughput you need to obtain? Is there a certain amount of flow days you need to average? What is important for your customer? And then that becomes the basis for your burning platform for change and a future road to vision. And then you use that information to calculate the tack time for your throughput. Uh, tack time is the drumbeat of your process. As the formula for tack time is available time divided by required output. And again, it represents how often you need to induct and produce something throughout your machine. And then we then take the formula for Little's Law and translate that formula to use tack time, which accounts for available days to determine the precise measures of your machine down to the measurement by date. 
I'll walk you through um, the formula in my B52 example, but for now I want you to understand that the importance of the math is that you used logic uh, to determine the pace of your machine. Uh, you didn't just make up a number. That burning platform along with the machine math really works together to help the enterprise understand what needs to happen and why. And then the next step is to frame the challenge. Uh, compare your current state to your future state to understand the amount of effort that needs to go into this improvement. Is it a, is it a big improvement needed? Uh, that's where you frame that challenge. And then the action plan. And this is really an enterprise action plan to achieve your road to goal. We then use tactical management to monitor the each's, the individual pieces of WIP that flow through our process. We need a means of knowing if a project is on track to its critical path. Does it have everything it needs? Are there any threats to the critical path? We do this either via scripts or other means of visualizing how the project is progressing to its plan. We use daily tactical management meetings to make this assessment. We determine what issues exist, which ones the team closest to the execution can solve, and which ones need to be elevated quickly for resolution. We also ensure we are following the rules of flow to ensure the best chance of success as we execute our aegis. And those rules of flow consist of controlling WIP. We do not want to overwhelm our process doers. They will try to work on everything you give them, but we want them to be better at finishing things than they are at starting things. So we control the amount of WIP we provide to our process doers. Releasing only supportable work. Uh, that's harder than it sounds. We want to make sure we put the right people, right numbers of people, and that they have everything they need to do that job. That takes a lot of planning up ahead of time to make sure you can release supportable work. And then releasing work based on a synchronized plan. That synchronized plan is an agreed upon sequence of work to allow synchronization to our processes. So it's not a pickup game. We have a prescribed order that we're going to do things so that we can synchronize others to our process. And then resolving issues quickly. Supervisors and managers cannot just assign work and move on. You have to go back and check with your process doer to ensure everything continues to go well and intervene if it isn't. Our enterprise stakeholders also attend these tactical meetings, uh, so they are attuned to the pace and the progress of our machines, and they are intimately involved in the issues. And leadership is constantly looking for how they can help. Tactical management is important because it provides the best chance of success for your projects with your current process. Operational management is important because it provides the basis for continually improving your process so they are better tomorrow than they are today. And you guessed it, this takes leadership engagement and enterprise involvement to be successful. So we refer to the model shown here uh, with the one, two, three, four as the AOP cycle. So the AOP cycle involves, as I mentioned before, establishing flow and identifying WIP. It also involves determining where the constraint is in your process, because if you improve that constraint, you improve your overall output of your process. So you resolve that constraint and that's that continuous piece. Um, so that is our AOP cycle. Once you find the constraint, you want to ensure you are tactically making the best use of that constraint possible. So think about rules of flow. You're getting the best out of that constraint you can get under current circumstances. And then you want to apply process improvement techniques to improve that constraint for the future. In Art of the Possible, we make use of process visibility in an operational sense by reviewing process and gate trends in a wall walk setting. On the right-hand side, you see a picture picture of our wall walks. Uh, they're attended by organizational leadership and enterprise stakeholders. A wall walk is led or facilitated by the process owner, which is often the squadron director, and gate owners are reviewing the trends, not the eaches, but the trends for the gate. And then collectively, uh, the whole team is coming up with what are the gaps, what are, what are the opportunities uh, to improve this particular gate and what are the actions that we can create to either resolve the gap or realize that opportunity. 
this meeting really becomes focused on the actions and the actions of owners and estimated completion dates. And it's an accounting for, are we taking the right actions to improve our overall process machine? Then finally, the radiator chart. The, this model looks intimidating uh, because there's just so much here. But when we break it down, we recognize uh, that this is really a tool for setting up and executing our machines. So if you look at the upper left-hand side, that you'll recognize our leadership model. And it is above the vertical green elements that are our leadership pillar. So you'll recognize some of those same elements in, that we talked about in the leadership model in the leadership pillar. And then they're on the Right-hand side, you'll recognize that art of the possible cycle, which represents our process. So it's above our process pillars, our elements that make up how we uh, use the enterprise, work with the enterprise, collaborate with the enterprise to improve our processes and ensure our process deliver uh, the best results. And then in the middle, uh, you'll recognize the gears that make up our process machines, and that represents execution and the execution elements. And the execution elements go from strategic to tactical. And the first four elements are the strategic piece where you're setting up your process machine. So if you have a brand new machine that you need to, to set up, you pick up the radiator chart and you just go down those top four elements. What is the road to? What is our process flow and our critical path? What are our gates? What are our release points? And the bottom four elements are process we were facing and it speaks to daily execution, having what, what you need to make sure you can understand if your process is on track, if you're having a good day. The length of the lines are on purpose. Uh, so the length of the elements of row two encompasses the whole model because it touches the whole model and it influences the whole model. Uh, the model looks like the elements are intertwined because they're so dependent upon one another. Um, and it really looks like and resembles the radiator in your vehicle. So much like that radiator in your vehicle, if your radiator is leaking or rusty, uh, then it's not going to help your vehicle run to its best. So uh, the same thing with our radiator chart. If we're missing one of these elements, our process machine is probably not running at its full capability. Um, one element I do wanna take a moment to explain because it's not uh, just readily apparent is the bottom leadership element, the three W's of walking, watching, and wandering with an A. These are things we do not want our process doer doing because if they're doing these, we didn't give them good direction or we didn't release them supportable work, um, which means that uh, leadership didn't set up the machine correctly. Um, but it is something we want our leadership doing because if they're uh, walking around, watching what's happening, and they're wondering with an O oh, what they can do to make it better, that's the type of environment that we're looking for. So, now I'd like to spend a little time using my experience with the B52 program depot maintenance machine to further explain art of the possible thinking. Some, some background first, we began implementing art of the possible on this machine in 2010, during a time when program depot maintenance whip was extremely high and a goal whip of eight seemed impossible. Around the 2013-2014 timeframe, we did actually achieve a whip of eight, at least for a time. Then, as they do, challenges happen, and we found ourselves in an environment with increasing whip and flow days. Um, so that was around the 2015 time, and we addressed that through the 2015-2016 time. Um, but even once we got through that challenge, um, we were left with that high flow day, high whip scenario. So the story begins at the end of FY16 and the beginning of FY17. So I said the first step was to define flow and find the whip. So on the upper left-hand side, you see a pictorial of our flow and where our whip was located at the end of FY16. So we had one aircraft in pre-doc, uh, we had four aircraft that had been through the pre-doc process and were in queue just waiting to go through the in-doc process. And the in-doc process has three gates that I'll talk about in a moment, but there were six aircraft uh, in undergoing that in-doc process. And then we had one aircraft in post-doc. So that's what our flow was and where the whip was in our flow. 
Next, you have to understand the critical path and build your gates around the critical path. So we did have an existing critical path and an existing gate structure. But what we found was that we really needed a succinct understanding of our gate exit criteria. What does done look like? And we concentrated on two gates in particular where there seemed to be some gray areas. So if you look at that, the pictures uh, at the bottom middle on the inspection gate, uh, what we wanted in this gate, what done looked like to us was understanding the condition of the aircraft. So starting with, um, you have to access all the areas that need to be inspected and then uh, complete the visual inspections, complete the non-destructive inspections, and then submit engineering dispositions for anything you found that was outside of tech battle limits and then get those dispositions back. So what we understood was we had to have those dispositions back in order for us to truly understand the condition of the aircraft. And then the repair gate, we had to understand that we had to have flaps installed and have all the major structural repairs completed in order to decradle that aircraft. And that was what uh, the end of repair gate looked like. So once we had that exit criteria established, we really concentrated on making checklists and making that closure process, that gate closure process, really robust. And then in the upper right-hand corner, you see what we call a gate summary. And so it really allows you at a glance to look at how all of the gates are doing to their targets so you can decide where you need uh, to put your uh, improvement efforts. So to explain the setup of this chart, the blue bars represent uh, the last six average of the aircraft that completed that gate. We use last six to represent uh, about a two to three months worth of work. So it's what's happened lately. Um, and then the uh, black bars, uh, which you can more easily see in some of the graphs than others, but the black bar represents the target um, and the uh, Orange or brownish bar represents what our last six average was last quarter. So you can tell, are we improving or uh, getting worse in our execution? Those dotted lines are really just um, projections for future quarters. The red bars indicate queue time. So it's the time, the last six average of the aircraft that's spent in queue in that particular uh, portion of the flow. And it's red because we see Q as a bad thing, although, uh, because it's wasted time, although when you use it as a tool, it's actually a good thing. So in some later charts, you'll see Q to repair, or Q to postdoc, meaning that we're using that as a tool to keep from overwhelming the resources uh, in the follow-on gates. So you can see at the end of FY16, we had a whip of 12. We had sold 13 to a target of 17 aircraft. Our flow days were 269 days with a queue of 67 days and a touch time of 202 days. We felt that touch time was important to understand because it helped us understand where our process was uh, if we were to eliminate queue, were we close to our goal? Um, the other thing I wanna say about that queue is just an average for that FY. And if you look at that gate summary chart, you'll notice that that last six average of queue in this fourth quarter of FY16 was approaching 80 days. So our queue was growing uh, at the end of FY16. So then the next step is to develop a road to goal. And our road to goal requirement did not change, but it was important to revisit the goal uh, because we had had an extreme change out of enterprise leadership and we needed to refocus everyone and re-baseline us all on what we needed to accomplish and why. So the first step is what is the burning platform? So for the B-52, Global Strike Command said they wanted to have our aircraft number captured to be only eight. Um, in, in program depot maintenance. And then they wanted our annual throughput to be 17 aircraft. So we use this information to build our machine. So first we calculate tack time. So tack time is available days divided by uh, throughput. So uh, 365 days divided by, for us inputs and outputs are the same. So 365 divided by 17 gives you a tack time calculation of 21.5 days. So every 21.5 days, we needed to be either inducting an asset 
and also producing an asset. And that's also the tack time for uh, going through our gates, conducting and producing. So then we use uh, the tack time Little's Law formula, which is um, tack time times whip equals flow days to determine our flow days. So um, when you look at our total whip of eight and you multiply that times 21.5, we find that we need to average 172 days in order to maintain that whip of eight. Then we take that same idea and uh, that same formula and apply it to each one of our gates. So our gate has a whip of one times 21.5, that's a 21 day gate where our gate has a whip of two and a half times 21.5 is a 54 day gate. And you might ask yourself, how do you have two and a half aircraft? Well, what that really means is that when you average those 54 days, occasionally you're going to have three aircraft and then sometimes you'll have two in that particular gate. So now we know what our target is. We know our burning platform and we know what it takes the calculation it takes to perform uh, to that burning platform. And so we have that machine structure. So now we needed to frame the challenge. So our goal whip is eight, our current whip was 12. Our throughput goal was 17, our throughput actual for FY16 was 13. Our flow day goal was 172 and our flow day actual was 269. We had work to do, we needed big, needle moving type changes. So then we needed to, as an enterprise, get together and create our action plan. And so our action plan started with a desire to examine our processes together as an enterprise. Uh, we, have, we knew we had to improve repair gate to improve the overall machine. Um, and one thing I wanna say about uh, our approach to use enterprise value stream mapping events was that it required leadership um, even at our group uh, and equal equal SPO level to our group um, to be involved. They had to come to our, uh, our kickoffs, our vector checks and our outbriefs to keep that team momentum going. Um, and so we could create that teaming environment. The next thing we wanted to focus on was standard work. And we did this primarily through scripting our work. Most of our improvement events centered around the script. I have a script example on the next slide to help explain what I mean by that. Um, improving tech data was a high priority in our action plan. And this really meant looking at our repeat dispositions to make sure we were incorporating the latest uh, updates into our tech data to reduce the number of times we had to ask. And then expanding kidding opportunities because this really allowed us to provide our technicians what they needed when they needed it. So I know at first glance, this slide really looks busy, uh, but I thought it was important to share a visual representation of what a script looks like for us. So this is our most complicated script where most of our variation occurs in our repair gate. We are fond of saying, we know what we're going to inspect, but we don't know what we're going to find. So what we attempted to do was standardize what we could find. And this really turned into what we call a plug and play script. So that means when we finish the inspect gate, now we understand the condition of the aircraft. So we can take uh, what we've mapped out um, for everything that could occur and then just plug in the pieces that are actually occurring on this particular aircraft in the time frame when they're going to occur. Uh, so to help you better understand what it is you're looking at, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, that first column, that's a list of the task. Each row is a task and the color code is just um, for the skill that's performing that task. Those magenta boxes that you see, those are information about kits that are needed for the task. And then um, along the top, what you see, those red boxes uh, in that very top row are critical path points along um, the path of this gate. Uh, in, in the actual script, they have very specific titles for what that critical path piece is about. But by having that critical path represented as our team is crossing off um, the, the task, the days of the task that they've completed, they can tell if they're on track to that critical path. And that brings me to each individual script. We took that one step further and said, we wanna know that each individual task 
whether it's on track. So we created milestones within each of those tasks. And on the actual script, there's a very descriptive uh, information about what that milestone is. And then there's just a whole lot of other information that the team, as we did our process improvement events, felt was important to have on this script to enable good communication, good handoffs, and good process flow. So again, almost every improvement event during this time was centered around the script, either collaborating on the order, creating the milestones, removing waste from the task, or better communication for handoffs. The scripts became our Bible for execution. And when I talked about setting up the machine, I talked about tactical management and tactical management is extremely important that for a successful B-52 PDM machine. Um, the production and support and enterprise teams had to be in lockstep with one another. And we did this through, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, daily production meetings, which really occurred in different uh, levels at about three times a day. Um, and these production meetings had our enterprise stakeholders present as well. Uh, so they're attuned to what's happening in our machine and what they need to do to help. And that meeting was really about, am I on critical path? How do I stay on critical path? Or if I'm off critical path, how do I, how do I recover uh, to get back on um, my critical path flow? It was really also about looking ahead. What do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do in five days? Do I have what I need to do that? Uh, is it supportable? And if not, can I fix it at my level or do I need to elevate that issue? So that was that daily focus on those issues. And then weekly, we had meetings that were at the squadron level uh, to also that were tactical management, but maybe just a level up from uh, the in-depth look that they did at the daily meetings. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see some of the charts we use uh, to perform those weekly meetings. So this is a way of looking at how the aircraft are performing in the gate so to help orient you on this chart. On the, the box on the left-hand side of the chart is the WIP, what the what the plan should be and what the WIP actual is. And then each bar of the chart is an aircraft. The dark blue is the uh, days that have, uh, that have actually elapsed. And the light blue are days that are projected. So the aircraft with the light blue are aircraft that are currently in work. The green line represents the goal for that gate. The red line represents the last six average as of the time that the last aircraft completed that gate. So you can easily tell if that last six average is increasing, if it's decreasing, and how far away it is from the goal. And also the yellow starburst is what type of improvement activity we're performing in that gate. So this weekly uh, meeting that we called our fixer meeting, really uh, we would talk about the eaches and if they were on or off track, we would talk about other um, supportability issues facing the machine as well with our enterprise partners to make sure we had good solutions. We also created what we called the intense management meeting with our enterprise partners. Um, and this included our engineering partners, our supply chain partners, our DLA partners, and any other partner within the ALC that helped move our B-52 machine along. And what we focused on in this particular meeting was the aircraft in inspect gate and the aircraft in the repair gate. Um, or were there anything, anything affecting or threatening the critical path of that aircraft? We would talk about it, make sure we had a good interim solution and a good long-term solution. And the collaboration that happened in that meeting was really important that, and it wouldn't have happened if we weren't all together focused on uh, that one issue and what was important to accomplish today so we could keep that aircraft moving along. And so what I hope you heard in that tactical management discussion was the need for leadership engagement and that enterprise involvement that success would not happen without those uh, two things. And then we go to improve. So in setting up the machine, I talked about the importance of looking at your machine from that operational view uh, to improve your machine process. It's about removing the team from the fire of the eaches so they can see improvement opportunities and also create that organizational learning. Our wall walk was my favorite meeting of the week. It was my meeting and I walked into that meeting saying, welcome to the B-52, walk the wall. This is my favorite meeting of the week because we're focused on actions that are improving our B-52 
production machine so we can reach a throughput of 17 aircraft. Uh, so um, again, this is where our gate owners reviewed the trends in each gate and we talked about the gaps and the opportunities. In this particular example on the right, uh, these are very overarching type gaps and opportunities and actions. We would really be more specific in our meetings, uh, but what you would see is every gate would have some type of improvement opportunity or action associated with it, but wherever the constraint gate was, that's where most of the actions were occurring. Um, this also helped us to create what we called our event-driven plan, and I've included that gate summary in the upper quad, upper left-hand quad of this event-driven plan, just to remind us of where we were. Uh, so remember that we were focusing on improving that repair gate, and it's easy to see that that repair gate uh, was the constraint in our process. But as we looked at the repair gate, we also realized that the inspection gate wasn't performing where it needed to perform as well, and it fed the repair gate. So we realized we needed to stabilize the inspection gate first in order to have our best chance of success when we looked at the repair gate. So we started in the inspection gate and our enterprise partners were right there with us, our new engineering uh, management team, our new logistics management team, our DLA and um, supply chain partners. And we started in inspect gate and gained a great understanding of some of the unique challenges of our B52 platform. And then our next, um, and of course we created a really robust inspection gate script because there's a ton of handoffs in that inspection gate. Our next event was total technical resolution. This is about how long does it take from the first time you identify an issue to get that final no kidding resolution. Um, and it was taking too long for a multitude of reasons and it was nobody's fault. When we looked at the process together, we found all kinds of opportunities uh, to make that process go better. Now, we had to actually do this event twice because we didn't get it right the first time. But by the time we finished that second total technical resolution event, so this would be our third event together as an enterprise, you could really see that we had formed a team uh, a team that understood what was before them and was committed uh, to taking actions and to having the involvement needed uh, to make the B-52 machine uh, perform at its best. So we were really set up for success when we got to that repair gate event. And then this is a view of our, what we call our Kaizen newspaper, which is how we keep track of, of action items once we leave an event. Uh, it gives you an idea of the type of team members we had in our event. I truly feel the key to our eventual success was built in those first four process improvement events. Uh, as we shared perspectives and built relationships with the enterprise and our, and our technicians and created a team focused on success for the people B52 PDM machine. Um, and then you see, in addition to having great teamwork relationships and that shared perspective, almost every event would focus on an improved kinning idea, improved tech data, better tooling. Uh, we came up with that plug and play repair script, uh, developed those gate milestones and business rules. So it really created that foundation that we needed uh, for success. So what did all of this effort get us? Uh, so you can see um, I put four different gate summaries on this quad. And we've talked about the FY16. And when you look at FY17, you almost think to yourself, well, I think it looks like you were getting worse because our, our uh, queue time went up, our touch time went up, our number of days went up. But remember, we had aircraft uh, sitting in the machine in FY16 causing this. And so what you can take away from this was um, by the end of FY17, that, that Q to NDOC had significantly decreased in that by that last quarter. And so we were definitely on the right path. We sold 17 aircraft that year. I will say that year, the 17th aircraft sold on the very last day of the FY. Um, but then as we get into FY18 and FY19, you see our whip continued to come down, our Q continued come to come down, our flow days and touch time uh, came down. You can see the queue uh, becoming evident in different places in the uh, process. And then um, also in FY18, we sold our last aircraft about a week before the end of the FY. And in FY19, three weeks before the end of the FY. So you could really see stabilization happening in the machine, all because the enterprise 
cared about what was happening. They got involved in what was happening and um, we made a difference by focusing on our processes. Now, the B-52 uh, continues and will always continue to face challenges, but the really important takeaway is that by having this art of the possible mindset, now they have the foundation uh, to manage through any of those challenges they have. Um, they've created this organizational learning that's created resiliency. So will they have issues to tackle? Yes. But do they know how to tackle them and have they kept that teaming environment going? Yes, so that gives them the best um, opportunity for success because of that art of the possible mindset. So this was a really quick explanation of art of the possible and its application in a specific production environment. But I hope it gives you a flavor of what the Air Force Sustainment Center is doing with their art of the possible business model. And just a reminder, uh, this was a production example, but I really like to foot stomp that any process, any process that you want to manage and you want to positively affect, you can apply these principles to that process uh, so that process will be successful. So I wanna thank you for your time and allowing me to share with you why I'm an art of the possible believer.